Hey, this is Jeff Kerr. I don't remember yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, you didn't fight uh, the Korean zombie. <laughs> no. No. You fought how many times? 88. Fuck off. 88? Yeah. Yes. You fought 88 other men. 88 fights. Yeah. How many were rematches? One of them might have been a woman, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you're not sure? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jeff Curran, uh, you're cornering Fleece, is that what you're doing? Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, uh, how's she doing? She's good. She's great, man. Salad diet, just feels good, full she, of energy, eating, yeah. Is she a show-off and like a clown and stuff when she trains? No, she's very serious when she trains. Um, she's definitely, you know, she's definitely a great personality um, outside of training, you know, fun and all that, so. Um, so when I came up doing martial arts and really digging, fighting and stuff, Jens Pulver, you, there were a couple of guys that were my guys. Because you guys fucking fought at lightweight, and you're like a bantamweight, probably really. A, yeah, yeah. I fought as I fought as light as flyweight. Right. I fought one one time at flyweight and never went back there. But um, I did make it. Probably if I was younger and had that weight class, I could have spent maybe 10 years there. But in my second, my last five years of fighting to try to go down in weight like that was tough. So 20, 25, 35, 45 in the first half of my career, maybe at 55. That's nuts, man. So. 30 or 40 guys that were uh, cutting to 155 pounds. You yep, spot. it got worse and worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet. Yeah, because they understood how to cut. They got more wrestlers in there who had yep. a lifetime of weight cutting. I fought a lot of guys back in the early days, first three, four years that were like 165, 170. I fought a 185 pound guy. But back then I was lifting weights, trying to be bigger just so I can be a little bit more the for them. Yeah, there was. more for them to throw around, you know. Right, right. Uh, and your cousin Pat, you corner him. Uh, I used training. to. You're not these days? No, we parted ways a couple of years ago. Um, so he's he's doing his own thing. Yeah, he is. Uh, and so Felice is good. You're good. After you guys, so the next wave of guys were kind of like that were my guys when you were a smaller fighter. We were like Hominick mm -hmm. and Uriah and guys like that. And they actually got to fight guys of their weight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this the other day because like one of the most transitional periods of my life was like feeling like at one point, I remember my manager, Monty Cox, he was like, Jeff, you know, you have probably one of the top six paid featherweights out there, but I was making nothing. And I'm like, man, I would hate to be in the seven or less, you know? And then I was like, I just, there's no opportunities for us. And then I turn into TV and this show called Warrior Nation pops up and they're, they're featuring this Uriah kid. And I'm like, man, whatever I got to do to fight him because... You know, we need guys like me and him need to meet, and um, we eventually fought, of course, and mm -hmm. didn't go my way. But um, I made a good friend in him, and I, you know, str and you made, guys are friends. Now? Yeah, yeah, and made made a good future for me to kind of focus on certain things. It's the only time ever my my near hundred fights have been submitted. Yeah, you know, so guillotine. Yeah, arm and guillotine. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so when you saw guys like that. It's funny, I was talking to Eddie Alvarez today, and I'm like a total mark for, for fight with that kind of guy. What's, what do we got? Did somebody ask a question? Yeah. What did they say? The question I saw was, um, not to cut you off, but no. was, what what do I think about um, Rafael Asuncao doing so well today? Because I fought him. Mm -hmm. um, I fought him, Pedro Munoz. It seems like every time I turn on a UFC and there's Bantamweight fighters, it's somebody I fought. Because so, you fought them all, though. Yeah. I'll tell you what happens. I text my manager and say, man, Raph's looking good, but I feel like I could still be looking good too. And he's like, no, you re you retired three times. I'm never going down that road with you again. And I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> How old are you? I'm 40. Fuck, man. You could still do it though. I could. The problem is the what I get paid, the organizations that I have to fight for because I'm not fighting for UFC, aren't going to pay me enough money to cover any kind of real medical bills if anything happens. Mm -hmm. um, my last fight with Rafael Stotts, um, you know, which by the way, I want to fight a prospect. I don't want to fight a guy on his outs. I want to fight a guy on his ups. Yeah, And um, that's tough. The, one of the first kicks he threw to the inside of my leg, tore a little ligament, cracked my knee on the outside, come to find out it was fractured and torn, and I hobbled around the rest of the fight like, fuck, man, what am I going to do because... I gotta go get this taken care of, and and that crossed your mind in the fight. Oh yeah, right that, away. That I'm like, I'm not getting paid. I'm not getting paid enough to cover this, but we'll deal with it later. 
So it's just that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I have to be a little more realistic, you know. Because I was, until you said not somebody later in his career, I was like, dude, we got to set you up fighting Ian McCall and Ryzen in Russia. They'll pay you real money. Yeah. Um, I, I would fight Ryzen. I would fight 1FC. I know fighting over in other countries where they have their own markets and they don't mm -hmm. have to rely on the U.S. market as much that um, we would have opportunities. I actually had a big conversation with Henzo. And I called him and asked him, you know, how he deals with retirement and stuff like that. And he's like, man, you know, I never say that word because you never know mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But some sheiks will pay him two million dollars to fight somebody. He's like, let's let me talk to some people, you know, and see if we can't get you over in Asia, because this is where a martial artist like you yeah. should be treated properly, paid well and get the opportunity to fight other, maybe even some other veterans, you know, mm -hmm. some other legend type guys like a, a fight like a Romino Sato type guy mm. who like we never met I never fought Iminari um, that's a that would be a great there's one. just a lot of fights yeah. that were he's like, gonna fight till he's 50 yeah these are fights that to me are not like gonna fight the most the recent knockout guy who might you know yeah. send me to the canvas but they're gonna be a tactical match and mm -hmm. it's gonna be something that I can do so I'm, I never say never yeah but. Well, in fact we're we're already talking about potential fights for you right now so yeah right you know but I hope my so, wife doesn't see this no um it, uh, i asked eddie uh when we were talking to, uh, to eddie he said was talking about how amazing it is to fight somebody good like and you were saying that you you see your eye and you're like one it's great you're gonna get paid because it's yeah. a flashy california guy who people like but also you want to fight the best guy yeah why like, why don't you want to fight the easiest guy, like most normal humans? It's just, <laughs> it's very unmotivating. And um, I'll tell you, like, the probably the biggest setback in my career, like, I have, a, we would have to talk for a couple hours right. to fill, for me to fill you in on mm -hmm. all of it. But after I fought Uriah, somewhere around, like, 15 out of 16 fights in a row that I won, 15 or six, 15 out of 16 fights that I won, I, I had a loss in there. And... Um, after I lost to Uriah, the, my manager and the uh, WC at the time, they said, you know, we have this option and that, that option. I said, nope, I want the next contender. And they said, I think you should just get, you know, continue to sharpen yourself and let's expose you to the fans a little bit. And I said, nope, nope, nope. So who's next? They said, well, if that's the case, then I can get you Mike Brown. Fuck. He was coming yeah. off of Bodog and I was like, yeah, I want him. I know Mike, I'll fight Mike. So then I lost to Mike. And I was like, man, so strong. I think I need to maybe drop a little lighter. Yeah. And that night, Aldo fought for the first time. And I was like, dude, these guys are huge. Yeah. How could I? And I was little and training and in shape. So I was like. Cutting gotta, zero pounds. Yeah, all that went yeah. through my head is like, I want to fight them. But I want to have a best shot at a career. So maybe if I go down a weight class and fight the best. So then I fought Joseph Benavides. And then I, after that. Fuck, those I, guys are all I so I lost bad. that fight by a close decision. And then. I thought I was basically told I was being cut, and then I pretty much begged, and they said, "We'll give you one more fight. It's going to be against Mizugaki." Mm -hmm. So I fought Takeda Mizugaki, coming off of a fight where he should have beat Miguel Torres. It was very close. I remember it. It was the main event in Chicago. The night I fought Benavides, is like, basically, he was kind of in some people's mind the uncrowned champ because he didn't get a, get the belt. So they said, if you fight him, we reset the clock. But if you lose, you got to go. So I fought him, and I lost a split decision. Right. And one of my one of the worst calls in my life. I just really felt like, even though I was on my the back a lot, he didn't do anything to me. And I was throwing on submissions and punching yeah. him, and you yeah. know, finished him with a good triangle at the end. And it just was like, finally, I'm back. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it's like you're cut. I'm like, fuck. Yeah, brutal, brutal. Um, should have fought some these guys. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, one in there. If they tossed in one that wasn't the best fighter in the world at yeah. the time. But that's who you are. Um, when, when you're on your back, so you, you had always a brilliant jiu-jitsu game. And you were the smaller guy in the gym. So naturally, you would develop a guard. You'd be pushed to right. your back, right? Yep. Um, today, we see the guard is back way more. Because people in gyms are thinking, for the last two, three years, you go anywhere and people are like, nah, we don't play guard. We get back up. Yep. And if everybody you're training with is getting back up, your ability to be aware and sensitive to the threats starts to diminish. Yeah. Because you're not in it all the time. And now we're seeing, of course, if people believe that long enough, you'll see it go the other way. And suddenly uh, the guard is a badass offensive position again. It's what it should be. And, you know, I, I kind of like, 
teach people to fight not like me. I think that's what makes me a good coach is that I tell somebody like, if I know somebody like one of my fighters, Joey Deal, he's got a really good guard. Mm -hmm. I, he knows that if he isn't successful with a finish or a good sweep from his back, he'll lose the fight. But he's a lot like me where he would rather stick to his belief mm -hmm. system. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where I'm at. I tell other people like, look, don't play your guard. You're gonna lose the you're gonna lose the decision. I'm not saying you're gonna get knocked out, but our goal should be a couple quick attempts to attack. Yeah. If it doesn't go our way, we're getting back up. But that changes with the fighter's development of their guard. Mm. When they come train, I don't say, hey, just get on top and work from the top. Everyone's got to work from their back, you know. Yeah. It's the only way it's gonna happen. The uh, I you see it change because once somebody believes anything, it's sort of it doesn't mean it's true. So everybody believes the guard doesn't work, get back up. So they start acting as if that's true, but that's not true. The truth is that is an offensive position. I yeah. can elbow the shit out of you from there. I can attack you, I can submit you. And if nobody's doing that in the gym and you, everyone, you're just training to keep people down, you're gonna fucking get submitted if you, if you don't train in yeah. that reality long enough. Yeah, you have to try. You know, it's such a matchup based thing, but for myself, I just, I probably would have had a longer career and a little more success if I was trained to get back to my feet. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I fight, and I, the main reason I ever wanted to fight was to represent Gracie Jiu-Jitsu across the board. It doesn't matter, Adil Gracie side, Carlson, uh, Carlson Gracie side, I just want to f represent Jiu-Jitsu and what, at its roots, so I don't want to, I might teach people how to defend jiu-jitsu so they have a mm -hmm. chance of a good career and making money. But for myself, I want to fight to represent the martial art that yeah. I believe in, and w even if it costs me my career, yeah. which is now, what it's kind of done. Well, it's interesting because when I talk, so I admire your work, I admire what you do. Uh, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. Thank you. And when I look at, and I have these conversations with people and they, they're, they're perspective of their own career they're like oh it would have been better if this or you know I didn't quite do that and I'm like are you fucking crazy you fought 88 times the best people mm -hmm. in the world you coach high-level fighters like you're fucking killing it but your perspective sometimes you'll look at it as what more could I have done or what didn't I do or do you know what I mean like I'm looking at it yeah. going, fucking Jeff Curran's got a killer life I'll, and yeah. and did cool shit I th no I I get that and I when I sit back and I like step back I look at it overall I say you know I'm happy with my life and I'm I'm very confident in the experience that I have. That's what I, I can own that much of it. But at the end of the day, I feel like the sport has enough cocky assholes who <laughs> are trying true. to be the squeaky wheel getting the grease. I think that the sport still needs humble martial artists. And that, that's what I started as. And that's how I just kind of like to finish. You know, I'd, I think I had a good career. I think that, um, you know, when you fought 20 years and as many times as I did and my total gross with sponsorships is two hundred thousand yeah, dollars That's fucking and, you know, sickening pay yeah. out pay out 20 30 percent. I average seven thousand dollars a year as a fighter That's insanity. So you do the math, you know, I when I talk success I'm right. happy with yeah. my performances some of my wins. I was upset with yeah. A lot of my losses, I was like, you know what, this is just opinion. I knew this was going to mm -hmm. go this way if I fought that way, but it is what it is. So success to me would have been nice to be able to like yeah. have some more money, have mm -hmm. some more longevity, not have somebody like the UFC tell me that, you know, at one point I was told basically that here's the problem with you is none of our champions are going to knock you out and finish you and none of our contenders are going to you're not gonna beat any of our contenders, so you're basically like a gatekeeper. And I said, so I'm getting fired because I'm a good fighter. Yeah, that's right. And it's more like, no, you're getting fired because you're, you're yeah. boring and you're not producing the result. But I believe there's enough martial yeah. artists out there who would have been like, no, I love to see Jeff fight. And there, yeah, you know, if the right matchups, I would start getting some momentum, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. my career was cut short. Yeah, well, yeah, it's- it, Or cut long. It, it, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. If your wife is watching, just turn it off, but we're, you know, we, we can still fight. <laughs> you can still go to, to uh, Japan or Ru Russia pays really well. I would really, go to Russia. Yeah, man, I love Russia. But I, I do want to get there. paid decent and yeah. I want to have the right fight, mm -hmm. you know, and- uh, yeah. I want to have the right notice, and I, I would consider it. Uh, you love coaching? Do you love it? Like, you love teaching martial arts to people? What I love the most, um, first of all, I can never coach somebody I don't like. I am not a coach for money. I'm not looking to have a big stable. I, at one point, had 45 fighters, 
and no life and no peace of mind and a lot of drama. I'm not looking to keep put up with everybody's shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. I have I have a school to run and students. I like I love teaching. It's the my second passion from competing and training myself is is teaching, but jiu-jitsu in particular? Yeah. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu most I don't teach Thai boxing at my school, only train my fighters. Mm-hmm. I let my other instructors oh, cool. teach the cl- group the Thai boxing classes and boxing classes, and then I just teach fighters private, you know, mm-hmm. and get them ready. Like I train Felice and all my pros. But the only reason I enjoy coaching is because I love my fighters. Right. I'm very close with Felice. I'm very close with my my pro team right now. Is only five deep, and then I have one pro boxer, and that's my cousin Sarah. Mm, so right. I love all those guys. So I really am interested in those people and helping mm-hmm. them and. If it wasn't for them, I don't know if I would want to start a brand new stable. Right. I will, I will organically grow one more fighter at a time. I'm like mm-hmm. the small little garden. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not a. But you want to make something good, yeah. not a lot of something average. And it has to be meaningful. You know, I can't leave my family for a week and you know sit in hotel rooms and then train oh. at night for one hour and you know maybe do a grocery store run and just the. the a week away from my students and work, unless I really care and love my uh, yeah. my fighters. So. Which you do, and which is why you're here. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Mark, I know we only have a certain amount of time here. What um, uh, what is fight night like for you now? Like, so you, you're, there's your 88, and then there's the hundred corners that you've done. What's it like now? Is it is it Normal? Does it feel regular? Do you still get nervous? Are you nervous for Felice? Like um, the most nervous I've ever been was a couple weeks ago when both of my kids, my eight-year-old, and my ten-year-old, fought for the first time on a in a Naga tournament. Ah, wicked! I had never been so nervous in my life because <laughs> the last thing I need that, them at eight and ten is saying, "Dad, I did everything you said and it didn't work." Right. My ten-year-old double gold. My one ah, other kid, he lost his first division, won his second division. So they both got to experience some defeat and, and some success and that was nerve wracking fighting fight night for me as a coach is never gets easier um, but I'm confident in my fighter so mm-hmm. I'm happy and I've I've coached over 1600 fights I've cornered wow. what did so, I say a couple hundred man 1600 I, I would do sh- we would do probably about 12 10 to 12 shows a year and it would be loaded with anywhere from 3 to 13 people uh, from my team on my local show. That's just my local show. And then, you know, we talk about all the big fights, but wow. yeah, a lot of fights, man. I've commentated almost 500 shows, so it's almost 5,000 fights. And I will never get tired of it. Like, I will never, are you still learning things? Like, are you still seeing things? Do you wake up some days and you're curious about something? And you're like, hey, what is that and why is that happening? Or is that rare now for you? No, I study, I study the fight. I study the fights a little bit after the fight. I don't spend too much time studying the opponent mm-hmm. of the people that they fight. Um, I always give like the day before the fight or the day, morning of. I always give one last look at like the most recent fight mm-hmm. and see if anything stands out. And that's always been good for me. It gives me one last glimpse, like anything like trigger, you know. I coach a lot like I train. I never studied mm-hmm. the person I was fighting. Mm, is, I would watch him and go, okay, I think I know how yeah. I'm going to fight. You know? to a, lot, the, a lot of people, the modern thinking now is, it's not a, that's just a body type and a collection of skills over there. Yeah. You know, if we they're know all, what it is. They're all less. good at everything. Yeah. I got to be good at everything. And I yeah. cannot um, game plan so much because if they're a good team, they're going to game plan opposite. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> yeah. there's going to be a big uh, contrast yeah. and hopefully yeah. not against me. Well, thanks for all your fights, man, and uh, enjoy it this weekend. All right, you too. All right.